I can't believe it. It's June 29th. It is Tuesday. It is the macro setup. I'm Guy Adami, joined, as always, by my dear friend, Dan Nathan. This macro setup brought to you by Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for, get ready, Dan, call spreads, binary options, and knockouts. I know you love that part. And we're also going to be joined by Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. Dan Nathan, how are you today? I'm doing great, Guy Adami. Another day, another green day for it's the incredible. markets here it doesn't it's remarkable end, right? yeah it's yeah. you is know it, you know people used to say why is the market higher and they used to say because it's open and that's become i mean there's there's a lot of truth in that dan nathan and listen you can say that all the headwinds seem to be abating and there's some good news you got earnings coming up um but there are a lot of things to be concerned about my sense is by the way um one of the reasons why we're seeing this sort of melt up is we're in the quarter end half year end yeah. obviously the month yeah. comes to an end of this week, but you know, say what you want, the market's impervious. But we're going to talk about some things that might be concerning under the hood, Dan Nathan. Yeah, I think that quarter end thing that you just mentioned is really important here. I mean, it's been a heck of a year. The SP 500 is up 14.5%. I think it's interesting on the macro setup over the last few months, we've been talking about that um, outperformance of the SP 500 um, versus the NASDAQ. At one point, I think the year to date gains of the SP 500 were nearly 2x that of the NASDAQ. Not something that we have seen a lot over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. That gap kind of closed into quarter end because we saw a re rotation back into some large cap tech and out of some cyclicals. Those are come some themes. Some of the reasons for that we're going to talk about over the next half an hour here. Um, but listen, you know, I got to go to this first. Um, this well, yeah, first... I, I'm cl- yeah, we have to go to this. You yeah. Led Zeppelin fan, Dan. I know you okay. like the Food Fighters and, and that <laughs> other group. What's I, that, I, the, the airborne toxic event? But yes. I got to say something. I'm a Zeppelin fan. Obviously, their last studio album, In Through the Outdoor, one of the great lines in rock history, one voice is clear above the din, Google it. Well, one of those voices is Lizanne Saunders, and she went on a tweet storm. Is that what you call it, a tweet storm today? Yeah. And this was the one that sort of caught our attention, Dan. Yeah, you know, every morning, I mean, she's a great resource for, for a lot of market data. She presents them without comment for the most part, I'm sure, to her clients over there at TD Ameritrade. She has, uh, and Schwab, she has um, plenty to say here. But this one, I, I I feel like this one was right up your alley, guy, okay? So the S&P 500 price to sales ratio is not to a new record high, well above the long-term average of 1.55 and the five-year average of 2.26. Now, here we are above three per uh, three. Okay, for mm-hmm. the price to sales of the S and P five hundred. Now we often hear a lot of pundits talk about price to earnings as this kind of um, simple sort of metric here, but price to sales is one where we've gotten comfortable. In, a, in this market with a lot of price to sales ratios that used to be deemed to be expensive if there were price to earnings. Why is that important to you here at this stage of the rally guy? Because it's just one more metric to look at in terms of people sort of saying it's different this time. Yeah. But, you know, this is a metric. And just for context, I think we all understand what happened in 1999, 2000. And you can see where we were back then. And obviously things collapsed. Just to understand, folks. S&P 500 looks great. The NASDAQ, everything's breaking out. Everything looks great. But below the surface and the metrics that matter, you know, we talk about um, the S&P over GDP trading it close to, I think, I don't know, to 150 something percent now. I mean, numbers that just don't make sense. And here we are, almost a standard deviation above the long term average in terms of north of three long term average being 155. Just understand what's going on beneath the surface. This thing, to me, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, here you go with a picture. Yeah. Man, well, well here, here's the thing. What I'd say what's different this time is good segue, I think, to the next headline here is we have five stocks, the Facebook, the Microsoft, the Apple, the Google, the Amazon, that all have greater than $1 trillion market values now. These are, these are more dominant companies than we have ever seen in the history of the world. It's just a fact. The moats that they have, the balance sheets that they have, the basic monopolies that they have. And so when you think about those five names, what do I call those guys? Uh, those the five F-Mega stocks? Complex. Yeah. 
The FMAGA complex, um, you know, they make more than $8 trillion in market cap. They're 20% of the S&P 500. And here's the thing, as the price of those things surge, their sales, you know, are not increasing with that sort of uh, tenacity, if you will. So we're starting to see, um, you know, some extended ratios there. Um, I just say this about those five names. They're also 40% of the NASDAQ 100. So what you'd go back to 2000, people will tell you that you had a concentration of some of the largest names in the market. Um, they didn't have the sort of earnings power and the sales growth that these companies have, but it is concerning the concentration of both major indices. No doubt. And Facebook joined the party yesterday. We have the headline up now. And I will tell you, I've said a number of times as we go to the first chart. I mean, Facebook, I hate everything about it. I find <laughs> Facebook to be, and I'll use the word, and I choose to use this word, reprehensible on yeah. every conceivable way except the stock. And the stock has just been grinding higher into earnings, probably looks great, which probably leads to us to why we're going to break out in the S&P 500, because the names you just mentioned starting to participate once again. And here we are for the first time ever. We saw 4,300 in the S&P 500, well above that 200-day moving average, healthily above that trend line that you've drawn so elegantly, Dan. Yeah. And this seems to suggest um, you know, a continued breakout to the upside, if not a parabolic move to the upside. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's quarter end. You know, you have this Russell rebalancing this week. Um, we're going to have Q2 earnings coming up. The Fed, uh, you know, listen, here's one on Friday. We're going to get the, the June jobs report. Um, if that is, again, like weak for the third month in a row, that just mm -hmm. gives the Fed a lot more cover to remain dovish here. You know, I could have dr uh, drawn a trend channel on this thing. You know, I suspect in the not so distant future, you know, the S&P will be banging up against the high end of that. You can see um, the potential for a pullback to the low end of that trend channel. Let's go to the five-year chart because I think this is really interesting, Guy. Um, if you just draw a line attaching all of the highs starting back to the high in early 2018, um, you get what was prior resistance, okay? And we saw that breakout late last sure. year above that. Look at where that resistance line now becomes support. You see what it lines up with right there? That right at the 200-day moving average, yeah. 3,800 and change. And a lot of yeah. people have been calling for it. We've, you know, it's, it's interesting there have been a number of people over the last month and a half, two months that are pointing to that level. And that probably, look, I mean, what is that, about 11% or so from yeah. where we are in terms of peak to trough? And maybe that makes sense. But I will tell you, it couldn't be further from the reality of the market right now as this S&P continues to grind. I don't know what the catalyst is going to be, but it's out there. It's just waiting in the weeds. Maybe it's getting through this quarter end, this half year end. I have no idea. But just be aware, folks, it looks great now. But as that first slide indicates... Things are absolutely frothy, Dan, Nathan. Yeah, I guess the only good news is that if you're playing the S&P 500 and you're wondering how it just levitates like this a little bit, um, you know, you're seeing these sector rotations under the hood, which are which are helping keep it propped up, right? So we moved out of some values, some cyclicals, transports, that sort of thing into the mega cap tech. And again, 20% of that index are those five names. Apple and Amazon have yet to make new all-time highs, but we know that um, Alphabet, Facebook, and Microsoft have. So if Alphabet, or excuse me, if Amazon and Apple were to join the party, then you get higher highs because some of the things that were doing really well, materials and banks and energy, they just don't make up a significant weight relative to those five names. But here's one thing I want to kind of catch your attention here, Guy, because you're saying you don't know what that thing is going to be. Let's go to the next chart here. This is implied volatility 30 day at the money um, for the SPX. This is the price of options. And what you see here is that we have just gotten below that kind of pre pandemic crash level, right? When, when the market really um, crashed in February into um, late March. And, you know, at about 11% implied volatility, you know, that's implying sub 1% moves here. So we are like this little grind here, just grind, grind, grind. And that's usually when you'll see these spikes. We have seen spikes um, in implied volatility. We've only had about four peak to trough declines this year, greater than about 3%. Um, so at some point in the not so distant future, we're likely to kind of challenge the the, the kind of 5% range. It just has to happen is, is my guess. And again, your guess is good as mine. It might have something to do with the change of the Fed signaling. Um, I don't know. It could have something to do with maybe uh, further variant, Delta variant fears that might kind of put a cap on some near-term global growth expectations, which may cause investors to rethink valuations guy down yeah and it's interesting i mean what this i look at this chart and what it says to me is you know people were rushing to buy options obviously for for very good reasons yeah 
15 or so months ago. And I think now that it's totally flipped. It's going the other side of the equation where people no longer buy options, but they're looking to sell options to create premium, to create a synthetic dividend for themselves because they're of the belief that the market never goes down. There's no reason to own options as protection. There's no reason to buy put protection when we can sell options and earn a synthetic dividend. And that's great. That works until it doesn't. That's not meant to be glib. But yeah. we've seen a number of times when people get caught on the wrong side of the vol trade, of the gamma trade, and you see what winds up happening. I'm not suggesting we're that close to it, but the fact that we're now at pre-pandemic levels suggests that complacency has run amok in the market, in my opinion, Dan Nathan. Fair enough. Let's go to the NASDAQ, the NDX 100. We just talked about those five names, the FMAGA, making up about um, 40% of the weight of that index of 100 stocks. You see that trend line that we drew there. You know, it's interesting that in mid-May, we were almost challenging that trend line guy. You know, there was still some trepidation about tech, but then we saw, um, <laughs> then we saw that um, that bounce here. We're up about 11.5% since mid-May. A lot of that has to do with some of those big names we just talked about, that 200-day moving average down there at 12,000. Um, 900 or so, 14,000 is the breakout. If you see that, I mean, that's kind of the next stop to the downside um, there. The NASDAQ chart, this is a this is an attractive chart. Guy. You almost want to see this thing back and fill a little bit. It's made a series of higher lows and higher highs over the course of the last year or so. There's been a couple uh, lower highs in there, but the trend has clearly been higher. Yeah, and what's remarkable about this chart, you could have a significant sell. I mean, when I say significant, all the way down to that trend line and still yeah. be in a significant uptrend. And, you know, people will say, I mean, that will look like, I hate to use the word, but that will look like a crash if, in fact, it happens. But yet, it's probably the healthiest thing that could happen because you'll stay in this uptrend line and basically did exactly what you're talking about, this back and fill. Now, you know, I've been waiting for it for a while, and we have not even come close to that 200-day moving average seemingly in 18 months, probably longer than that. I mean, it's been a while since we last saw that, but there will come a point where we do. Maybe it comes in the form of earnings at the end of July. Maybe earnings are disappointing. What I'll tell you, though, just getting granular, not that we do this on the macro setup, but I think Amazon sets up as best as it has in quite some time in terms of breaking through that 3550 level or so yeah. um, and staying above it. And that's going to sort of, I think it's probably going to sort of take this thing to the next level in terms of the NDX. We'll see. That's a great looking chart though. There's no, you can't cast aspersions yeah. here, Dan, Nathan, you like what I did there? Yeah, uh, listen, let's get a little granular here in the NDX. Let's look at the, the the SMH, the ETF that tracks the semiconductor industry. And one of the reasons why semis are so important is more and more they're going into almost every single thing, every single consumer product, every industrial product, every everything here. And the SMH, you know, has been in this consolidation range. It's a pretty wide range on the downside guy, probably what, like 220-ish to, to mm -hmm. about 260 here in the last two days, two closes above the prior highs. That, that, that's that's a really nice looking chart. Again, might we see a failed breakout here and a consolidation? Um, I just want to mention one thing is that there's obviously um, a lot of supply chain hiccups as it relates to semi-production and there's a lot of delays um, for products. There's probably a lot of double ordering. There's a lot of things going on here. It will all resolve itself over the next three to six months, I suspect. And you'll see um, probably the semis within the NASDAQ 100 reassert themselves. You have been all over NVIDIA. I'll let you speak to that real quickly. I just want to go to Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the largest component in the SMH here. And what's interesting about this one, as the SMH made new highs, it did it without its 14% largest component, um, which is down almost 10% from its all-time highs in February. You see the chart that I drew. It's amazing. People ask, why do you guys rely on charts so much? Well, we don't initiate ideas with charts, but we also use them often as an input. Look at that low in March. Look at that low in May. It corresponds with the breakout level in in late December, early January. That is support. Oh, and by the way, the 200-day moving average is right in and around that same exact level. And so could we see continued chop between 119 and 110 or something like that? Yeah, that might be a great scenario, but I suspect if we do have demand continuing to be very strong and some of these supply chain hiccups fixed, Taiwan Semi is going to be the one you want to own here, and it's going to lead the SMH higher. But talk about a name that you've literally mentioned on the macro setup on Fast Money almost every week for the last 
uh, years. Um, NVIDIA is just blowing out right now. Also a big North, Yeah, I mean, incredible move since earnings. You know, it's interesting that NVIDIA had that one day post earnings where it did nothing and people were sort of left scratching their heads saying, yeah, you know, what, what's the market really looking for? And then ever since then, it's been off to the races. And here we are. My sense is you're going to get some uh, increased price targets. I think so, we've seen some 850s. My sense is you'll start seeing people ratchet it closer to a thousand dollars a share. And that's not going to make any sense in terms of the valuations that we talked about at the beginning of this show. But in terms of growth, there's one semi name that's in all the right places in terms of growth. And just to sort of put a bow on your Taiwan semi, if it can think about Taiwan semi, the SMH is seemingly breaking out to an all-time high without TSM, which, yeah. as you pointed out, is 14% of the index. If Taiwan semi gets above 120, that 142 level is absolutely in the crosshairs, and it probably takes the SMH significantly higher. And with that, I think we have to talk about yields because yields have been either holding back the semis or giving tailwinds to the semis. And you've been all over the yield story as well, Dan Nathan. So let's sort of slide it, Earl, as we get yeah. to the 10 year. Well, and, and you know, listen, again, when the when yields went from 1% to one and a half or actually 175, I mean, you were calling for it. I give you a ton of credit. You were pounding the table that you, that yields were way too low given the environment that we're in, despite what the Fed was saying, and you thought we'd get to two percent. We almost got there. I mean, you had a really yeah. great call. But what's happened over the last few months, we've just seen that down channel or that downtrend. Uh, we've gotten as low as what, 137 or 138 or something like that, maybe to the downside on an intraday spike, that 200-day moving average down there at 1.2. Again, I go back to if we have the third consecutive month of weak jobs data, despite the hot inflation reads, gives the Fed cover. Um, the, 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 the rates probably trend a bit lower. If they break that downtrend channel, they're probably going to 1.2. If they go to 1.2, that's good for tech stocks here because tech stocks went sideways for the better part of the first quarter. Why? Because there was a valuation trade versus rates moving higher, that sort of thing. And investors wanted to move into more cyclically um, exposed names, more GDP exposed names. And they did that. But now they're rotating back. That says to me that maybe investors have sniffed it out, that rates are going lower in the near term. It's interesting. And you've been, and you know, listen, maybe I was right for a while, but you've been right over the last few months in terms of thinking rates going back down. And we saw two Sundays ago, I think, 10-year yields actually traded yeah. down to 135. And I was shocked to see that. I'm not sure what the catalyst was. You know, today we find ourselves sort of straddling the one and a half level. We'll see. I'm going to stand by my belief that rates are going higher, but it's hard. I'm hard pressed to sort of stand by it when you see the next chart, which is the TLT. So yeah. this, is a, this is a pretty clear breakout above a pretty significant downtrend line. And you wonder, now that we've done it, are we going to get up to that 148 level-ish and if we do in the TLT 148, that probably coincides with that 135 that we saw a while back then. Yeah, so the TLT, the iShares 20-year U.S. Treasury bond ETF acts inverse to yields, right? And so this is not going to be like dollar for dollar or, or point for point or anything like that with the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. But you can kind of make some, some guesses of where this thing might go. Um, if you were to see one, two in the 10-year over the next few months, I suspect that you have the TLT through 150 above that 200-day moving average and possibly back to that January breakdown level um, at 155. And I'll just mention this because sometimes uh, and I know the Nadex crowd likes to think through the options um, lens here a little bit. Look at the chart of implied volatility of the TLT. Again, people, this is the U.S. Treasury 20-year bond ETF. And I'm looking at implied vol 30-day at the money at a 12% or slightly above that. That is greater than that of the S. PX, the S&P 500 index. Should that be the case, guys? Should bond ETF no, vol you know, I mean, you're be the, higher? I mean, you know the answer. It's a rhetorical question. I think okay, there's sorry. an ancient rhetorical, and you're trying to, so yeah. what's that? What you always see it tweaking Trigger. me or yeah, triggering, triggering me. You're yeah. triggering me because there's absolutely no way that bond volatility should be north of where equity volatility is. It speaks to something. There's something wrong, again, under the hood that doesn't make any sense whatsoever that bond volatility is where it is. If it, Listen, that should be the most liquid, unvolatile instrument on planet Earth, and it's anything but right now. And listen, I think it's just a matter of time before bond volatility makes its way into equity volatility. Again, just my opinion, but since you led me down that primrose path, I figured I'd go down it with you. 
All right, let's take a couple minutes here real quickly, Guy, before we bring Chris Vecchio in from Daily FX, their senior strategist, who is, as you use the term, a stud. So we're starting yeah, to have him here. He let's just hit this last topic real quickly because I think it's a good segue um, into Chris here. Gold dropped to two-month low as dollar gains and COVID concerns here. So this Delta variant strain, which is causing some serious palpitations in some areas of the world where they thought they had the, the, the uh, coronavirus under control, parts of Australia in lockdown. Israel went back to a mass mandate, reversing um, course after just a couple weeks. The UK um, you know, is banned from travel or ba- travel to Hong Kong. We're seeing um, infection rates in parts of the US that do not have high vaccination rates increase. We don't know if it's the Delta variant um, yet, but I think the thing about Israel that hit, hit um, herd immunity faster than most other countries in the world, what they're seeing right now is that 50% of the cases are among people that have already been vaccinated specifically with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, Moderna's out with some some data this morning saying that their uh, vaccine is doing very well against most variants. Is this a blip here? I mean, you know, markets here in the U.S. don't really seem to care, at least on the equity market side, maybe on the rate side. I think you have some thoughts there. Let's hit a couple things quickly. Well, on the rate side, for sure. I mean, I think we're going to look at the dollar here because I think on the rate side, it's obviously, in my opinion, been yield bearish in other words yields going lower or tlt bullish depending on how you want to look at it but the other thing is you know the u.s dollar again for whatever reason in this dxy that 88 and a half 89 level has been supported a number of times we've bounced back above 92 the bounce in the dollar clearly is not bullish for gold and i think that's what's going on i'm not really sure why we're seeing this flight to quality in the form of the dxy but it's clear that it's happening i think you've pointed out a number of times that it's become, you know, every time it goes below 90, it becomes a very crowded trade. Everybody trying yeah. to get short the dollar for that breakdown, and it's just not happening. Maybe it happens when you least expect it, but right now the dollar seems to have found terra firma, as they say. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do at least with the Dixie, because we know that 50% of that is kind of the Euro basket. Maybe the Eurozone is just having a dip, more difficult time on their reopening, and that's your flight to quality. But to your point, when rates are going lower, you expect the dollar to follow suit a little bit here. And we've seen the inverse of that over the last year. Um, so the dollar, definitely worth keeping an eye on that 93 half or, or, or so level, which was the high in early mm-hmm. April, um, late March. I think that'll be a really important level, but we're above that downtrend, above that 200-day moving average. It did the same thing in March, April. Let's see um, what happens here in the next few weeks or over the course of the summer if we can get this this Delta variant under control. All right, so, Guy, we got to go quickly, though, to gold. Um, Yeah, and we'll look at gold real quick. I mean, look, gold is, in terms of the XAU, clearly breaking down. I I thought it would get through those highs, those sort of December, Jan highs, got up there, and failed because I thought it would get through it and test the last summer's high nowhere near. You look at this chart and you say, well, it's absolutely going to do the back and fill all the way down to that downtrend line that you drew so elegantly around 1700 or so. Um, and that's just the state of the state. Dollar continues to rally. It's going to be negative for gold. I would have sworn that gold would have traded a lot better with Bitcoin, which will be our next chart getting cut in half. That hasn't happened, Dan Nathan. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, man. I mean, the major bull case right now is store of value for Bitcoin. If we go to that chart and, and and look at what happened, you know, gold had that huge run in the throes of the kind of pandemic crash, but but Bitcoin was still being treated as a different sort of risk asset. Once once Bitcoin started to rally in the summer and go on that parabolic move, um, gold, you know, kind of just gave it up there a little bit. And so the fact that gold had this sort of little mini renaissance, it took a 50% peak to drop decline in Bitcoin to make that happen. And now that Bitcoin has, has really held, there's one number in Bitcoin world that they care about, and that's 30,000 that it holds there. And so here we have that chart, that 40,000 level is important, but the 42.4 number, the 200 day moving average, I think there's a lot of crypto people who want to see us um, back above 40 and then really retaking that 200 day moving average. And I think that's what's um, a big part of what's been moving gold um, lately here. But again, I would say that pre, that's a pretty precarious bounce um, in the Bitcoin because 10, 15 percent moves have not been hard to come by here. And it wouldn't take other than one tape bomb here. So I love that tape bomb. You mentioned Renaissance, a happy belated birthday to Mel Brooks. I just think of Mel Brooks when you say Renaissance baby. for some reason. I mean, yeah. he is a Renaissance man. And you know who else is a Renaissance man? <laughs> 
Our first guest and last guest, as it turns out, Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. Chris, you've been sitting patiently listening to Dan and I drone on. Uh, I know you want to talk about gold, um, but before we talk about gold, sort of macro thoughts as we get you on this macro setup. So you guys have talked a lot about this Delta variant in, in the last uh, you know few days. We've seen some headlines come across the newswire that have been concerning. But I think when we actually take a look at the data, we should expect that more and more vaccinated people will eventually get sick. The thing is that we're seeing that among the va vaccinated populations, hospitalization rates are low, deaths are much lower. And so I kind of see this as a wall of worry for the second half of the year where there's this constant threat at the margin that never really metastasizes into a full-blown risk to the economy in the South, which already has the economic infrastructure for more outdoor retail and services. You probably don't see shutdowns and moreover, those are states run by Republican governors. And then in the North, you have higher vaccination rates where there's actually not a lot of political will thanks to some of the union issues going on in the Democratic run states. So I think the economy stays open. I don't think we go into lockdowns here in the U.S. Uh, the federal government doesn't seem to be pushing there. And, and this is a catalyst where we have this constant concern at the margin, and it's an excuse for the Fed to just keep rates lower for longer. I think that's exactly, I think you, you're, you're, all your points are well taken. That last point is, is probably the most important one. It gives air cover to the Fed. And the first chart you want to speak to is gold. You heard Dan and I talk about it. You got a much better looking chart, but maybe you can speak to what you see here. It's really not good news for gold because around the Fed meeting a few weeks ago, we saw that inflation expectations took a big dive. And even though the long end of the yield curve, we actually seen some flattening, more, more or less a negative butterfly uh, in the Treasury yield curve. This speaks to the fact that the market's kind of getting prepared for a situation where uh, there's not as much liquidity floating around. And then we take a look at what's going on with the Fed's reverse repo facility. Those have been some very high numbers recently, but there's a lot of cash strain coming out of the system. And that's not great for gold. Uh, and then moreover, if we talk about what kind of economic recovery we're going through, the pandemic is more like a natural disaster than the global financial crisis itself, which means that we should have a stronger, sharper recovery and the window where we have accommodation uh, may be shorter. So gold right now, there's really not a lot to like. Fundamentally, real rates are starting to move against it. And technically, a lot of damage has been done. I do think we're going to get that dip lower back to that trend line that we've been looking at since May 2019 intersected with the pandemic lows in March 2020. And that brings us closer to 1700, 1730 into the summer months. It's interesting, Guy, um, you know, Chris, to demonstrate his bearish view, draw that uptrend, which is really important. It gets you back down to 1700. The chart that I drew with the downtrend also gets you to 1700. It's amazing how this stuff works here. I, I, listen, I love the technicals. I mean, <laughs> as you know, I mean, Chris does a great job. I don't know if he's yeah. made the Parthenon with Carter Worth and Luis Yamada, but he's damn close. He's getting which there. Which then brings us to our next chart, which is the one we talk about all the time. U.S. dollar. You heard Dan and I talk about it. Obviously, I thought it was going to break down. It didn't. Bouncing here. What are your thoughts, Chris? Yeah, I was with you looking for a breakdown myself, but we did see that that downtrend from the pandemic swing highs was broken. And we've now more or less entered this sideways consolidation which to me matches up a lot with what we see typically during year two of equity bull markets, which is the middle portion of year two tends to be a lot of sideways action. So if the dollar is antithetical to risk, it's a safe haven currency, uh, then we should expect it to trade sideways for a period of time. And now we find ourselves back in an area that actually was support last summer into the fall, which has quickly become resistance. I could see us winnowing down into a tighter and tighter range over the next few months. And so the broader dollar index, most dollar pairs may not be all that appealing uh, from a trading perspective, unless, of course, range trading is your thing. Yeah. So, so Chris, interesting. You know, we talked a little bit about that Dixie before just a couple of minutes ago and, you know, the euro at what, 50 percent of that basket or so. What are some other crosses that you find interesting here that are tradable because, you know, we're likely to see some catalysts that kind of bust them out of some of these ranges? Because I look at this chart that you have right here in the Dixie. This is going to set up either as a great short at that downtrend, right, just below the prior high and maybe a move back towards that 90. And again, people who are trading these um, um, uh, at Nadex and, and a lot of your, your your viewers or clients over at Daily FX, they're looking for these kind of range opportunities here. They're not looking for the home run. They're looking for singles and doubles here. Um, would you, A, on the Dixie, you, you'll look to kind of reshort this thing below 93 at that downtrend and play for a cover at 90. And then what are some other crosses that are interesting to you right here? Yeah. So with the dollar right now, I kind of take this, you know, we're thinking about it in portfolio rebalancing terms, like a constant mix strategy. As the dollar rallies, we sell a little bit. As it falls, we buy. Yeah. 
a little bit back until there's a decision all that much. And then with the yield story, the long end of the curve, it's reflecting an inflation premium and a growth premium as well. And so when the Fed tells us that they're going to taper, they're going to see a rate hike come sooner than expected, we're actually saying that growth in the future will be lower because in the interim period, we're going to have a higher rate, which reduces credit growth, which reduces business formation, and therefore hiring will be actually curtailed. So yeah, just, that, right? yeah, just, you know, Chris, I, I actually think that's one of the really big false narratives out there. You know, you made a great point that this is not like the financial crisis. It's more like a national, you know, natural disaster, if you will. But the expectations for growth on the way out of this, what's different this time is the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of deficit spending that was tacked on to global sovereign banks, you know what I mean? And their ability to kind of finance that debt going forward. So so I, I actually think that this is not going to go the way people think it was. And I think it's really important to go back to remember in the in the years following the financial crisis, we had Guy, you remember this. Chris was probably in eighth Which grade. Which one? The, tw- the 29 one? No, or? No, 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 not the 29 or not the 87 uh, or not even the 70s when you were worried about inflation, Guy. This was just the one 10, 11 years ago <laughs> when people were obsessed with a double dip recession. Remember that? Like there was an obsession with that, right? And that was one of the also one of the reasons that kind of gave the Fed some cover. So I while they're very different and you outlined it very well, I think it's important to remember that this is not going to be a straight line recovery and it's going to look different globally. And I think also what's different this time is that think about where we were globalization wise and think about the, the strain on supply chains. They will get fixed. You know what I mean? But it's going to take a little bit of time and it's going to cause some disruption and we're going to have fits and starts, I think, with the global reflation trade. I think you make a great point and you've been you've been spot on with this and you've been steadfast in your belief. We'll see how it plays out. I'm not, you know, I have a little bit of a different view, but as they say, Dan, that's what makes markets. And what also makes markets are some of these FX crosses like that segue. Yeah. And the first one we want yeah. to look at with Chris is uh, dollar yen. Well, well, you know, this is actually one of the, uh, you know, I guess antithetical to the point I was making earlier, because if we do see yields go up and to Dan's point, you get this mix of, of loose monetary policy, high deficit spending, that should be inflationary. And for a pair like dollar yen, that has a high correlation uh, to inflation differentials to interest rate differentials. So if, in the event that we do see some broader dollar range trading, we see equities continue to improve. That's going to reduce demand for the Japanese yen. And Dollar yen seems really well positioned right now as that vehicle to get U.S. dollar exposure in the event of further strength. We have a, a multi-year symmetrical triangle that formed going back to the highs in 2015. We made a breakout earlier on this year. Now it's some, some consolidation, excuse me, for a few weeks. And so the market has been relieved of some of these near-term overbought pressures. It may be time to move up again. And we do have this non farm payrolls report this coming week, which could very well be that catalyst. I want to go to oil because you have an oil chart as well. I mean, I think in terms of commodities, everybody has jumped on the oil bandwagon, rightly so, quite frankly, because it's been fascinating to look at. Can you speak to what you see in terms of the oil chart? Yeah, so we've talked about oil for a little while on this show for the past few weeks. And one of the major reasons is that a lot of the other alternatives in the commodity space I just too much interference going on right now. Like with industrial base metals, China is releasing stockpiles to help curb uh, domestic price pressures for producers. And as a result, copper, nickel, iron, they're not really great vehicles for that pure expression of growth. Whereas with oil, we have OPEC Plus continuing to throttle back production. They've been floating out headlines like, we're not going to do a million dollar barrel resumption. It's only going to be 500K. And that in and of itself keeps this supply demand imbalance tilted towards greater demand. And right now, oil with its high correlation of global growth and short but steady technicals, I think there's a lot of reasons why people like it. It's a simple trade at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting. And you know, I think if you were to get, if the, if the dollar were just sort of a, you know, a bait in terms of its move higher and sort of continue that downtrend, I think you're going to see that move closer to $100 that a lot of people are calling for. Dan, Nathan, I know you have some pretty strong yeah, Strong I, I mean, thoughts on the I mean, oil. again, I, you know, uh, you know, while I expect rates to go lower first, the dollar's acting counter to that. And I just go back again to what happened in the post financial crisis years, even as we, you know, started to really contemplate what a taper of QE looked like, the dollar started to rally. I mean, it started to rally hard and crude got absolutely destroyed. And so, again, this would go back to my thesis a little bit that this reflation trade is not going to be particularly linear. It's going to 
to be choppy here. And then we might see that dollar move higher as a flight to quality. Um, and you might see demand for, you know, again, for crude, um, you know, go lower. I mean, pre-pandemic, guys, where was oil trading? What were we talking about? We were talking about the move away from carbon, you know, uh, based, you know, oil and, and that sort of thing. So to me, I don't know. I, I think it's always important. One of the reasons why we have a, a nice little round table here and we're so uh, fortunate to have, you know, Chris here is that we get to kind of go back and forth on these ideas because we don't want to always be in the consensus, right? And um, I like Chris's chart here. That makes sense to me. He showed me a level uh, in the high 60s where on a pullback, you might see people reload, but to the downside, you break that little mini uptrend that we've been in over the last few months, and you're going to see a move back maybe to that breakout level somewhere in the mid 40s again. So again, we're just trying to get reasons why from a qualitative standpoint, some of this stuff might happen. And it doesn't always happen when everyone's on the same side of the boat. Look at you just putting a bow on this entire conversation. <laughs> well, I want to thank Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. I want to say now a regular on them. Can I say that? A regular yeah, on them? Totally I think that's fair. Yeah. So thanks, Chris. You notice, by the way, I got knotted up today in your honor, number one. <laughs> Number two, thank I you. want to thank Dan Nathan, as always. Uh, I did you know, not get, do it with Chris. I, mean, no, I did you not get nodded no, up. You, you and I look like we're going to play some golf or something like that. But um, it was great yeah. having you on, man. I appreciate you, you joining us. Always bad, a golf, bad golf, no doubt. I also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Nadex. Dan Nathan, get ready. The leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and Dan? Knockouts, buddy. You're damn straight. We'll see you next week. <laughs> see you next week, everyone. Thanks.